Excuse the word Vaishma in Hebrew comes from the word Shama, which means to hear. And as Dila said, well, there's something about it. It's like hearing that woke him up, that it was somehow internalized. But it's even deeper than that. In the Bible, the word Shema literally means also to understand. And you can see that in a few places in the Bible. Um, let's put them up here on the screen. In the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, it says, come let us descend and there uh, and confuse their language that they should not understand one another's language. Not understand. In Hebrew, it's yishme'u. They should not understand. It's clear they shouldn't hear each other's language. Yishme'u there means they would not understand each other's language. And then again, in the famous story of Kings uh, chapter 3, where Solomon makes his one request from God. God says, you can choose anything you want. Anything you want. It's like, you can choose money. You can choose power. And here Solomon says, may you grant your servant a listening or an understanding heart to judge your people, to distinguish between good and evil. For who can judge this formidable people of yours? A lev shomea is a listening heart that's able to understand the difference between good and evil, that's able to make judgment calls. Shomea means listen, but it also means to understand. So that's really important. So now here's something deep. Before Sinai, God reaches out to the people. It's like as if he wants to make sure that they want to enter into this relationship. It's like a covenant that's like a two-sided deal. And over the next few chapters, it happens three times. God asks and Israel affirms. But there's something really striking about how they confirm. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs points out this nuance in the text that I think is just absolutely astute and it just nails it. Look at the verses in Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. God says, listen, do you want to accept this covenant? The entire people responded together and said, everything that Hashem has spoken, we shall do. And then later on, Exodus chapter 24, verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of Hashem and all of the ordinances, and the entire people responded with one voice, and they said, all the words that Hashem has spoken to us, we will do. So in both cases, the people of Israel respond together unanimously. It's like in one verse, it says they responded together. It says yachdav. And the other, it says they responded with one voice, kol echad. It's like, okay. Now there's one more time that the people of Israel accept upon themselves this eternal covenant and responsibility. And this one in Jewish tradition is the most famous of all quotes. And it brings us right back to that idea of Shomea. Look at Exodus chapter 24, verse seven. He took the book of the covenant and read in the ears of the people. And they said, everything that Hashem has said, we will do and we will listen or we will understand. Now notice there's no together here. There's no one voice here. It's like they all agree seemingly separately though. The text is teaching us something here. And the first two, they're like, hey, we're doing this together. We're doing this as one voice. And here, like for some reason, they're accepting the responsibility upon themselves, but it's not as one voice. And you know, usually when we read this verse, the idea that comes to mind is that Israel committed to action before they understood what was being asked of them. It's like they're not waiting for the inspiration to come. They're just going to act. And in the action, they're going to figure it out. And like in that moment, they disclosed one of the greatest secrets of the Torah, that only through action and living can you come to an internalized understanding. Only through na'aseh can we have the nishma. It's like living committed to good, to walking in God's ways. That is what opens you up to the experience of God in the world. It's like in the act of giving, in the act of loving, you experience a way to God's presence. Na'aseh venishma. It's like in action, you will understand. And there's a lot to talk about there. But I want to focus on another point. The first two times, the people agree as one people. They say it like together. And what's that about? It's why is that? The people agree to a covenant. They say it with one voice. They say it unanimously. And... This idea though, we will do and we will understand this third time, they say it, but there's no mention of the unity and the togetherness. Why? What's the difference? So the first two times, if you look at the verses, the focus is just on doing. 
you're going to get to give your hear these commands. Will you follow them? The entire nation says with one voice, yes, we will do it. But this third time, it's not only about doing, it's also about understanding. It's also about listening. And here we're given a blueprint for believers in the Bible. Everyone will understand God differently. Everyone will experience the divine, relate to the divine, understand at their level. In the Jewish tradition, there are mystics and there are rationalists. In the biblical tradition, there's legalists and there's prophets. There's naturalists and supernaturalists. There's philosophers. There's poets. People have different spiritual inclinations, emotional inclinations, backgrounds, education. The Torah here leaves room for Jethro, for Yitro, who undoubtedly understood God differently. Coming from Midian as a priest of idolatry, coming to the people of Israel who saw the splitting of the, the Red Sea before their very eyes. They clearly understand, experience God differently. And the Torah giving us this foundation. Here we are, a unified moral code of behavior. But it leaves absolute freedom for each person to discover his or own way in spiritual understandings. It's like our code of living unites us, but our minds, our hearts, are free to explore, to question, to develop, to change. The Torah and the Bible is not a theology and it's not a philosophy. The basic biblical claim is that our actions reflect our beliefs. You want to know what a person really believes? Look at how he acts. The same way you can know if a good, if a tree is good or unhealthy, look at its fruits. You can tell by the fruits what that tree is really all about. The Ten Commandments, that's how we serve God collectively. But our understanding, that's how we serve God individually. Those two ideas are the foundations of what will bring the world together. Two images come to mind when I think of that like amazing biblical principle. The first is ISIS. You know, they force their captives on their knees to repeat specific phrases, trying in some ways to like tell them to speak out their beliefs, controlling their speech. It's like, I was like, what are they doing? Forcing people to say words. It looks so primitive. And then I look at the radical left that's doing the same type of thing. They're passing laws trying to force people to speak in a certain way, only using particular words and specifically not using these other words. The radical left, they may seem more enlightened, but their forceful coercion of ideas and speech and beliefs is just as real. And so the contrast here, here the, prof, the prophets of the Bible, they give us this vision of a world united, unity through prayer. Jerusalem, a house of prayer for all nations. Just like Yitro, the nations of the world may have totally different understandings, different expressions, different experiences of God. But in the act of prayer, wow, we're all united praying to God. In the same messianic vision, it says the Torah, the guidance will go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. The moral code for living, those 10 commandments, that's what unites humanity in action. It's like the 10 commandments, that's how we serve God collectively. Our understanding is how we serve God individually, and our unity is expressed in prayer. Shalom, my name is Jeremy Gimpel. A few months ago, we started an online seminar teaching life-changing biblical wisdom revealed from the original Hebrew and straight from the mountains of Judea. With global instability on the rise, more and more people are turning to God, realizing now they don't exactly know where to look for guidance. The Bible says the guidance will come from the land of Israel. What started as an online seminar has grown into a global fellowship with hundreds of members from over 30 countries. We are participating in fulfilling prophecy as we learn the Bible through the eyes of prophecy with a focus on what it's telling about us in our lives today. What you will discover is that the wisdom transmitted thousands of years ago is speaking directly to us in our time right now. Instead of learning the Bible as a religion, it's the Torah of Israel, the living guidance of God. So please join us for our next online gathering and get access to the full library of teachings that the Land of Israel Fellowship is offering. Join now and get an audio series on the prophecy encoded in the book of Joshua, absolutely for free. Just click on the link below or email fellowship at thelandofisrael.com. I don't know how you found this video or what compelled you to click on that link, but I don't believe in coincidence. And I would encourage you to take the next step 
on your journey toward the land of Israel. I hope to see you at the Land of Israel Fellowship. Shalom.